welcome to the Mind Institute Distinguished Lecture Series. Isn't this extraordinary? So many people here. And I think we, we owe it to one person and owe it to, uh, I think, an interest in the good practical way that we can learn. As you know, we have a Distinguished Lecture Series at the Mind Institute that uh, is in Sacramento, we've never drawn this many people. Uh, to have this many people here in Davis makes us know there's a large audience here as well, and we really appreciate how many people are coming out, and we hope that you'll want to learn more about the Mind Institute. My name is Bob Hendren. I'm the executive director at the Mind Institute. David Amaral agreed to share this with me, who is our director of research and the person who organizes the Distinguished Lecture Series and has done a marvelous job at that. So I know you didn't come here to hear me talk, but I'm going to introduce the next person who will introduce our speaker. Dr. Marjorie Solomon Friedman will introduce our speaker for tonight. Could I ask first that you turn off your cell phones and that you, um, at the end, know that we have a time for question and answers, so you'll have that opportunity at the end of your talk. Welcome. Thank you, Bob. Good evening, I'm Dr. Marjorie Solomon, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and at the MIND Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to the MIND Institute's Distinguished Speaker Series. As evidenced by our need to move our talk here to Davis with an auditorium over five times as large as our auditorium, our speaker tonight needs little introduction. Most people are lucky if they achieve prominence in one career during their lifetime. Our speaker today has distinguished herself in at least two. Dr. Grandin earned her PhD in animal science from the University of Illinois in 1989. She currently is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. She consults extensively in the beef industry on facility design and livestock handling. Close to half of the cattle in the United States are handled in systems she has developed. She's received numerous awards for her work in the beef industry and in the humane treatment of animals. Her book, Animals in Translation, was nominated as a top science book of the year by Discover Magazine in 2006. However, since this is the Mind Institute speaker series, you've probably come here to hear about Dr. Grandin's second distinguished career. In this second career, Dr. Grandin has truly given of herself in helping us all to better understand the experience of being a person with autism. Dr. Grandin is extremely articulate in describing her perceptions. Consequently, she's been invited um, on most of the top TV news and radio talk shows in the country. She's also a superb writer and has authored several books about her own life, including Thinking in Pictures and Emergence, as well as several more practical works about critical issues for persons with autism. Developing Talents by Autism Asperger Press and Understanding Unwritten Rules, which is published by Future Horizons. As both a parent of three sons and a professional who works with children on the autism spectrum, Dr. Grandin's life history and accomplishments serve as a clear reminder to me and perhaps to us all that our job as parents and teachers, both with and without autism, is to help them to discover what they love, to help them to clarify their strengths and their challenges, and to imbue them with sufficient internal strength to make their mark on the world. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Temple Grandin, whose talk is entitled, My Experiences with Autism. It's really great to be here today. I gotta turn this mic away so we don't get feedback because that's something that really bothers me. When I was a little kid, I had all of the full-blown symptoms of autism. I had no language, I had tantrums, you know, I would just sit and rock. You might wonder, what's the difference between autism and Asperger's? The main difference is, is that in autism you have obvious speech delay, in Asperger's you don't. There's a continuum of traits, some very severe, all the way up to a scientist uh, like Einstein. In fact, if you didn't have a little bit of the autism genes, you probably wouldn't have any musicians, artists, or scientists. 
In fact, you wouldn't have any iPods or any of these other little cell phone toys because it takes a little bit of autism genes to get people interested in making those sort of things. Now, I can't emphasize enough the importance of early intervention. I had really good early intervention. By two and a half, I had a speech teacher who did a lot of ABA type of stuff with me, and she'd stretch out and enunciate the hard consonant sounds. My mother hired a nanny, and we spent lots of time playing turn-taking games. I had to be taught sharing, had to be taught turn-taking games, and getting lots of hours of good intervention. There also were some real advantages growing up in the 50s, because social rules were taught, table manners were taught, saying please and thank you was taught. You know, I, I've seen a lot of 40 and 50, 60 year old Asperger's out in the workplace actually doing quite well. But some of the younger ones that haven't been getting that kind of disciplined upbringing it, it sometimes have a real problem. Now the thing is, you must never mix up sensory problems with bad behavior. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But I can't emphasize enough about getting 20 hours or more a week really good one-to-ones with a very, very effective teacher. When I was little and the school bell went off, it hurt my ears like a dentist drill. It was just absolutely terrible. Another kid may have visual sensitivities. These sensory problems are really variable. I mean, one way you can kind of figure out how severe the sensory sensitivities are is to ask what happens at Walmart. And if every time you go to Walmart it's a screaming fit, then you've got very, very severe sensory problems. But it's variable. One kid's going to like running water. Another kid's going to go running away from it. But things like the smoke alarm are often the worst. My auditory threshold is normal. You go test the hearing, it's normal. But that tells you nothing about auditory detail, the ability to hear the hard consonant sounds. And these problems are inside the brain. We need to be doing a lot more research on the sensory issues, on the problems with hearing. Because a lot of these sensory issues are very, very debilitating. You know, if you can't tolerate a normal store environment or an office environment, that really uh, messes up your language. Now, some kids are echolalic and they're repeating back all these commercials. Why do they do that? They don't hear very well, so they tend to repeat back, sort of like repeating back a phone number. Kids can yak back a whole commercial and they may not know what that commercial means. They may think the tone of the language is the communication rather than the words. And then you got to teach them that the words have meaning by pay, uh, with flashcards, pairing hundreds of words to pictures. And then they'll start to pick those pictures out and understand it. This is some work Ami Klin did, where he had people watch a movie called Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And I have to say, a really boring social movie, the kind of movie <laughs> that when I'm on an airplane, the headphone does not stay on for this movie. You know, I have to say, Night in the Museum was uh, that's sort of more my speed. <laughs> Shrek is kind of more of my speed. I watched that movie, The Guardian, on a plane. That was really good. The headphones stayed on for the whole uh, trip. Now, when they were looking at, they were looking at the eye. Uh, you know, looking at the eyes. Now, I didn't know that people had all these secret little eye signals until I read about them in a book when I was 50. I didn't even know that that existed. Now look at how many times a normal person looks back and forth between the eyes. The autistic doesn't look hard, back and forth hardly at all. They're the red line. Now this tells me some other things other than social. Attention shifting slowness. Brains that have problems take much longer to shift back and forth. Also, the autistic's looking at the mouth. Why are they looking at the mouth? They don't hear very well. They're trying to figure out what's being said. And the other thing is, a lot of people on the spectrum have difficulty seeing and hearing at the same time. That's difficult for me. And sometimes looking at the eyes makes it harder to hear. And when I'm in a noisy environment, I sometimes just have to turn my dominant ear towards the person so I can concentrate on what's being said. Try to look at their eyes and then I can't hear what's being said. One of the things that's a big problem for brains with problems is multitasking. Absolutely cannot multitask. I've either got to listen to something, got to hear something. Donna Williams talks about mono-channel in her books. I talk about that in my book, um, Thinking in Pictures. Donna has a wonderful book called Autism and Inside Out Approach. And the Jessica Kingsley catalog, I just saw that this afternoon, and it's still in print. And if you want to understand sensory problems, it's a great book. Now, some people 
have visual processing problems. Now, I want to emphasize these problems with the sensory, it's all inside the head. The ears are fine, the eyeballs are fine, it's inside the brain. And when they go to look at things, sometimes the image breaks up. This picture is from Oliver Sacks' migraine book. I don't have this problem. Now, how can you tell if a kid's got sensory processing problems with their eyes? Well, they tend to flick a lot around their um, eyes. Uh, if you take them to a strange house, they may go down the stairs like a blind person. So they have a hard time judging depth. And they also may have problems with reading. Okay, here are some signs of visual processing problems. A lot of finger flicking around the eyes. They tilt the head and look out the corner of their eye because they can hear better. They often hate escalators because they can't tell when to get on and off. They hate fluorescent lights. Now, I was very interested to hear today, the Mind Institute has special fluorescent lights that are on 300 cycles rather than 60 cycles. But regular 60 cycle fluorescent lights, they can see that flicking on and off like a disc attack and it drives them crazy. They may have difficulty catching a ball, and guess what? Your eye exams are going to be normal. But you still have got a problem with the brain. Now, some of these kids, when they go to read, the print will jiggle on the page. Some dyslexics have this. When I talk about all these sensory things, some of the ADHD people have it. We've got to do more research on the sensory. Why are we doing research just on social and not doing anything on sensory? And sensory is some of the most debilitating stuff that there is for both nonverbal and for really smart people that are you know, like Asperger computer programmers. You know, and they're doing their programming in a dark room because they can't stand the fluorescent lights because it's driving them crazy. But I want to emphasize the variability. It's one person, the sensory problems are mild. My problems are hearing sensitivity and touch sensitivity. I can't stand scratchy clothes against my skin. They just drive me crazy. You know, I still wear, I have to wear uh, underwear inside out because I can't stand the, the stitching against me. You know, a lot of the jeans now, they've made, I don't know, they get this yucky, cheap cotton that is itchy, and that really bothers me. Here are some simple interventions for the visual processing problems. Try putting just an incandescent lamp, an old-fashioned, energy, wasteful, hot light bulb uh, next to the desk. You might try, uh, you know, if you're lucky, get these 300 hertz uh, fluorescent lights. Um, you can wear a hat to block the fluorescent lights. Try a laptop computer. A laptop computer is the only screen that doesn't flicker. Um, I worked with a student that had dyslexia, and I couldn't quite to figure out why she wouldn't use the big computers. And she said they flickered and they drove her crazy. And there's been students where a laptop saved their career, saved so they wouldn't be flunking out of school, because the other kinds of screens were going on and off like a disc attack. And even some of the desktop flat, flat panels, they've got a fluorescent light inside, so they're no good either. Let's just stick with a laptop. We know that's good. Try printing the homework on gray tan or pastel paper to reduce the contrast. Some people are really helped by the colored lenses. OK, let's, some, let's try a really simple thing. Go down to Walmart, and if you have a lot of very severe sensory problems, you tend to really, really hate, hate, hate Walmart. And Try on all the pale sunglasses. I talked to one mom whose kid could only do five minutes of Walmart. And after the kid tried some pink sunglasses on, she could do an hour of Walmart. <laughs> but again, these glasses are not going to help everybody. This is a th problem with the spectrum. It is so variable. Maybe they only help one out of 10, but they really help those one out of 10. Try playing balancing games. You know, there's been a lot of success with these therapeutic writing programs. I've heard parents say that speech came in. Why is the therapeutic writing so good? It's a combination of a rhythmic activity and a balancing activity. The two things together, somehow that tends to stabilize the brain. Work on some of the swinging activities and balancing activities, like sitting on a ball while you're doing your ABA and while you're doing your speech therapy. And then there's some people where prism glasses work. That has to be done by a professional, by a developmental optometrist. And there's a book by Kaplan about it. Now, what are some simple things we can do for noise sensitivity? You can do the um, uh, auditory training, various auditory training programs where you listen to electronically distorted music, and it helps you to uh, sometimes helps reduce the sound sensitivity, help the hearing consonants. Another simple thing you might try is take the dreaded fire alarm or smoke alarm and record it on a recording device. And then you play it very softly. 
You let the child or the adult control the volume. They must control it. They must initiate it. And then you gradually increase it. And sometimes you can desensitize that way. Now, if you want to wear earplugs, they must be off for half the day. If you leave them on all the time, you're going to make the hearing more sensitive. I know you all have had wax in your ears, the doctor cleans it out, and everything sounds loud. That's because the brain compensated for the ear wax. Uh, make sure that you can wear the ear plugs for the horrible gymnasium or for the cafeteria, but other times a day they've got to be off. You've got to have half the day where they are off of you. Now, scientists have learned a lot. Sensory problems are real. There's been some good research uh, done on it. We need a whole lot more research. Lower brain areas are immature. There's been a lot of great research done by Eric Horshain and Nancy Minshew. Uh, there's abnormal circuits between brain regions. There's actually quite a lot that is known. You know, it's sort of like a brain is like a big office building. And the interdepartmental connections between brain regions are poor. Uh, sensory problems are extremely variable from case to case. Another uh, really interesting research by Nancy Minshew is that, is that word-based tasks are processed in the visual cortex. She did a really, really interesting paper where they had, get a person in the functional MRI scanner where they can look at brain function and they're asked these sentences and then they have to answer whether they're true or false. Now a visual sentence would be high visual would be something like, you know, um, Cats, dogs, and rocks are all living things. Okay, that would be false. And then something that is non-visual would be subtraction and addition are both math. Now, when I read the method section of that paper, I saw my third grade classroom. Even that, that thing that's considered non-visual, I was processing it visually because I'm a visual thinker. The frontal cortex tends to be used less. And the frontal cortex tends to have the worst problems with connections. Now I want to get into behavior problems caused by autism or Asperger's that we're going to need to make some accommodations for. Screaming when the fire alarm goes off. You know, uh, tantrums in the big supermarket. There are some people that may not be able to tolerate a big supermarket. Problems with scratchy clothes. Poor handwriting. Don't get a kid so frustrated with handwriting that you lose literacy. You know, two fingers on a keyboard, nothing wrong with two fingers on a keyboard, and problems with fluorescent lights. These are real things. We may have to accommodate these things. This is what we don't accommodate, bad behavior. And this is where being a child of the 50s is really helpful. And you gotta, you've got to differentiate between bad behavior and a sensory problem. You never, ever punish a sensory problem. But rudeness wasn't tolerated. I was taught table manners. I was taught that I couldn't you know, eat mashed potatoes with my hands. I had to say please and thank you. I had to sit through church, and I didn't like church. I thought it was very boring. Now, fortunately, our church had a beautiful organ that didn't hurt my ears. If our church had had electronic blasting rock and roll, I would not have been able to tolerate that. You see, this is where you got to differentiate between the sensory overload and bad behavior. And I had to sit through fancy Sunday dinners at my grandmother's. And when I look back at these things, it was very, very good training. Sloppiness and being an absolute pig is another thing. You know, there's uh, people losing good jobs because they're laughing at a fat lady or they're swearing. Well, there were some consequences with some of these things. TV would be taken away for one night. But you never, ever, ever take away something that could be the kid's career, like musical instruments or art or computer programming. Yeah, we take the video game away for a day. But the programming of the video game, again, we don't take that away because we've got to nurture the things that could turn into careers. It's really, really, really important. You know, because talents are kind of like fragile flowers. You know, they can be stomped on and they've got to be nurtured. Now, how do you know if a kid's a visual thinker or what kind of thinker? By third or fourth grade, they'll spontaneously be drawing things. You know, my parents did a lot to nurture that. You know, I was given art lessons and professional art supplies. You know, that was really encouraged. And my career is based on drawing. Now, I'm a visual thinker, and it's literally like having pictures in your head. I think like Google for images, and everything I think about is in images. It's, uh, even if I think about things that are kind of abstract, like justice, I have to see pictures in my mind of different specific cases, ones where I thought they had a just uh, outcome and ones where I didn't think they had a just outcome. 
Now, I use thinking in pictures when I do my work on designing equipment. And I can test run equipment in my head. I didn't know that other people's minds didn't work this way until I started questioning people about how they thought. And I asked them, access your memory on church steeples. Now, I just see specific ones. But most people get kind of a generalized one. Some people get a very specific kind of generalized one. And some people that are not visual at all get just like that, just two lines. <laughs> and there are a few people where there's no picture at all. And there's another one of my projects. But it was interesting to find out how my thinking differed from other people's thinking. And I like this project because I like to fantasize about what the archaeologists are going to think it's for when they dig it up. <laughs> now, how do you form a concept when you think in pictures? Well, a young man sent me this picture to show how he sorted cats and dogs into little boxes in his brain. Categories. Categories are the beginning of concept formation. You sort information into categories. Now, when I started out, I knew that dogs were bigger than cats. Yeah, but then what happens when you get a little tiny dog? And I can remember when our next door neighbors got a dachshund, and how did I figure out that the dachshund was not a cat? I had to find a new visual feature every dog has that none of the cats have. And every single dog, no matter how teensy-weensy, has got exactly the same nose. So I categorize them by nose shape. It's sensory-based thinking, not word-based thinking. Now I could also do it by barking or meowing. I could do it by their smell. It's sensory-based putting things into categories. Now, Nancy Minshew did some brain scans on me to look at the big trunk lines that are in the brain. I'm the red one, and my control, my sex age match control is a blue one. And I was really, uh, I really was blown away when I got these scans back. And I go, wow, I really do have a big, big, big internet cable deep into the primary visual cortex. And I used to joke around about this. And, and now I found out that you know, I actually have this. And some other people with autism have it. You know, everybody has a big trunk line, but I just got a bigger one. But the price I pay is I can't multitask. You know, there's some things I can do really well. And multitasking, I can tell you right now, it's not one of them. And take a little higher up scan, I got a real big one on the right, and my one on the left's pretty puny. Now, I have found in talking to people that the autistic mind and the Asperger mind is a specialist mind tends to be good at one thing, bad at something else. And research that Dr. Corshane has shown that there's sort of like, like not enough wires to go around to wire up this office building evenly. So like one department tends to get a whole bunch of you know, internet connections. The other one doesn't get much. And I'm a photorealistic visual thinker, and I'm bad at algebra. Those too often we pound away at the deficit rather than building the talent. We should have, I mean, I should have gone on to geometry and trig. That wasn't done. Big, big, big mistake. I'm not saying forget math. I'm saying forget algebra. I have talked to, I have talked to parents where the kid can do high level physics, but they cannot do algebra. You see, there's no way to make a picture. Then you have the music and math mind. This is a form of visual thinking, but it's patterns rather than photorealistic pictures. And if you read that new book, on a Born on a Blue Morning, this is the guy that was profiled on 60 Minutes, uh, the mathematical savant. It's thinking in patterns rather than in pictures. Now the thing is, you know, developability in music, there's got to be some access to musical instruments. If I'm going to access to musical instruments, then how can it develop? They've got to get access to math. Let's say you have a situation where the kid's good at math. Well, maybe a kid needs to be doing eighth grade math, but he may need to do second grade reading. But don't make the kid do baby second grade math where he's just bored. You might have a kid in high school that needs to do college math. Then let him do it. And then you have the verbal guy. Non-visual thinker, loves history, terrible at drawing, but they'll know every statistic. They'll know like the name of every band. They'll know all the sports statistics. Very good with those sorts of things. Some of these guys make really good journalists. Now, 
This praying mantis, I want to give you a glimpse into what the pattern thinker is all about. That praying mantis is made out of origami folded paper. What you see in the background is the folding pattern for the praying mantis. Now I just can't, you know, do this at all. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to like figure out myself looking into these, you know, different kinds of minds. Now, you want to teach a concept to a guide dog, like what an intersection is, I've got to show him many, many different intersections. Too often parents say to me, oh, my kid knows the rules when he's at home about not running across the street, but at Granny's he runs across the street, at the library he runs across the street. You've got to teach him in maybe 15 different places that you don't run across the street. Then he'll get the concept. You've got to train this guide dog on 10 or 15 different types of intersections. So he gets a concept. If you only train him on intersections with painted white line crosswalks, he won't know what to do on ones that have no crosswalks. So you've got to teach him on ones with stop signs, ones with no stop signs. Then he's going to get it, many, many different kinds, to form an intersection concept made up of many specific examples. See, the thing is, it's specific to general. The normal brain goes the other way, general to specific. I take the details and piece the details together into a general principle. Let's do some games with playing with uh, categories. Now, if you say to an autistic kid, pick out the red things, they may do that. But they might not pick out any of them because there's some white on some of these objects. But where the autistic really has problems is making up new categories. There's some other work that Dr. Minshew did. And let's say make up new categories like contains plastic, contains metal, is a round object. Now, when we were little kids, we used to play that game 20 questions. You know, which is basically a game of categories. You ask, is it animal, plant, or mineral? Is it used in sport? No. You know, and you narrow down what the object is. That's a game of categories. Play games with categories. This will help teach flexible thinking. Now, how do I think about very abstract things, like what the Lord's Prayer meant? Well, when I went to a little special speech therapy school, one of the first things I was taught was to say the Lord's Prayer. No, I had absolutely no idea what it meant. Thou art in heaven. I didn't know what that meant. Now, there was one little girl that thought it was God up in heaven painting on an easel. Thou art in heaven. <laughs> and the only part that I understood was the power and the glory. And this is my picture for the power and the glory. We've got a rainbow here with an electrical tower at the base of the rainbow. That is the power and the glory. Is autistic learning just memorization? Yes, in the beginning it is. Yes, it's just scripting. But as I learn more and more scripts, and I load more and more information into my head, I now have more web pages inside my head that I can search with my own internal Google. So it's really, really important to expose the kid to lots and lots of different experiences. So I know, yeah, I told this guy off, yeah, I got fired from a job, that was really, you know, a bad thing. I don't want to be, um, be doing that. You know, they need to be exposed to things. Sometimes they need to be a little pushed. You know, I was scared to go out to my aunt's ranch when I was, um, in, when I was in high school. Now, surprises don't do surprises. That scares. You know, but the trip was planned for a long time. My mother says, well, if you don't like it, you can come back in two weeks. I turned out I loved it. Sometimes they need to be pushed a bit to try new things. Like, I was scared to go to the lumber yard and buy lumber myself, even though I was remodeling the kitchen. Well, mother made me go to the lumber yard by myself. Yep, I came back crying, but I came back with the stuff. And then the next trip to the lumber yard was fine. I can remember the first time I bought gas. I was petrified, you know, but I did it. Now, that was back in the days where you didn't have to do it yourself, so it actually was a little less scary. But, you know, I, I did it. Now, people that are visual thinkers are often really good at hidden figure test. You see the figure there? How well can you see it? And you, get, uh, you know, people that are on the spectrum are often real good at this. And what happens when you put them in the brain scanner is it's like getting a direct line right into the visual part of the brain. So now I'm going to show you some pictures I'm going to call visual symbol pictures. I'm going to show you how I can use visual thinking in a much more abstract sort of way. And that's the visual symbol picture for the brain scan of the autistic person. It's like, yeah, all the wires went into the visual part and the rest of the brain is kind of shut off. It's like this little cabin out in the snowy wilderness. And this lamp store is a visual symbol picture 
for the brain scan of the normal person. You got so much other stuff turned on here, kind of interferes. The language covers up the sensory-based kinds of thinking. What's that all about? That reminds me to talk about interconnectedness of the brain. That the brain is sort of like a big office building. The skeletal building reminds me of interconnectedness. You see, if I don't have a visual image, I can't think. Have to bring a visual image up or there just isn't thinking. And you might look at this and go, well, what does that have to do with the brain? Well, it's sort of like a scaffolding for thinking. The thing is, when you hear a word, you see a word, you speak a word, or you think about a word, see different parts turn on. And in the normal part of the brain, there's all kinds of circuits that connect up everything together. And in the autistic brain, there's less of this interconnections. Now, this beautiful picture was published in the journal Neurology by Dr. Bruce Miller, and it looks like autistic savant art, but it's not. But it gives us great insight into how language covers up the visual thinking and the musical thinking. This actually came from an Alzheimer's patient that had a type of Alzheimer's called frontal temporal lobe dementia. And as the language got wrecked, art talent came out of like a stockbroker, a tape deck installer, you know, people with no previous interest in art. Show you another one of these pictures. They, this might happen for four or five years. And then the Alzheimer's wrecks everything. But there's a four or five year window when his art talent comes out and they get real autistic -y acting too, you know, during this time. You know, make teaching math concrete. I had a set of these blocks with different lengths of blocks for different numbers. This made it much easier. Teach fractions by cutting up fruit. So you under, really understand half. Teach sharing by dividing the juice up evenly between four different kids. You know, in the 50s, all the things that were fun to do, you had to take turns. I mean, you had to play hockey. Table hockey was something you had to do with somebody else. You couldn't do it by yourself. And I think this was really good. And I was bad about sharing. I was bad about turn taking. But I had to learn these things. Here's teaching math with just little pieces that you can touch. You know, let's teach multiplication. Five times six equals 30. I got five pennies this way, six down this way. I fill out the grid. Now I can see that multiplication is sort of a form of adding. And this came from the teach program. I got five minus one equals four. And when you take away the piece, you bag it. You bag the piece in a baggie that you took away. To teach the idea of subtraction. Here's six minus five equals one, and you've bagged the piece. Now, what's this all about? What am I doing here putting these boxes up here on forklift pallets when I'm going to be talking about emotion? Well, the, the mind research has been doing some really interesting research and in finding that the amygdala, the emotion center, is abnormal. And about eight years ago, our library at Colorado State University got flooded. And what they're doing is rescuing wet books. And I was very, very upset about books being wrecked because it was knowledge being destroyed. See, the thing is, I am what I do. And yes, I had emotions. When kids teased me in high school, it was absolutely awful. Getting teased in high school was absolutely the worst, worst part of my life. It was completely, totally dreadful. And, but where I had fun, was with shared interests. Riding horses, the students that rode horses did not do teasing. You know, and then while we're talking about animals, I just want to add that the book table out there does have about 30 copies or 20 copies of animals in translation left, a few copies of emergence left. They're right out there in the lobby. We want to make sure we get those books sold out tonight. They don't want to take them back to the bookstore. Just want to make sure you know that they're back there. And one of the things I talk about in animals in translation is that horses were just sort of my salvation. Because the kids that liked horses were not the kids that did the teasing. The kids that liked electronics were not the kids that did the teasing. These specialized activities, they were refuges away from horrible teasing. Now, I was mainstreamed into a normal elementary school. But there's some kids that need to be taken out of this awful high school pressure social cooker. You know, you can teach a kid all kinds of social skills, and it's very important. 
But for some of the people on the spectrum, it's kind of a social, emotional relatedness that may not be there. Now, in my book, The Unwritten Social Rules, that I did with Sean Barron, what's interesting in that book is how Sean has a few more social circuits hooked up. And he's different. And how he, there's some things that are the same. The sensory things are the same. Obsession with stuff. His was school buses. That was similar to some of my obsessions. Um, that kind of stuff was the same. But he was more emotionally related than I was. And he got frustrated by that. Where I was sort of like the pure techie mind. As long as I was out there with the other techie people, you know, I was really happy. And one of the reasons why I put so much emphasis on career is, you know, the happy techie is a techie that gets to do cool stuff. And you get magazines like Business Week magazine. I've read a lot of profiles in there of people who invented all kinds of electronic things. And boy, it's Asperger land. I think a subscription to Business Week <laughs> belongs in every school guidance office. I think Business Week's a lovely magazine. I just love it. <laughs> because the thing is, you've got to introduce kids to lots of interesting things. How do you know what kind of job that you can do if you don't know about interesting things? Now, Nancy Minshew did another brain scan, and she found I was more interested in things than I was in looking at pictures of people. And what they did this experiment, she didn't tell me the hypothesis. She started showing me all these weird videos of people, airplanes flying over the Grand Canyon, bridges and apples and all kinds of objects. And I'm looking at this, where'd you get this 1970s video? How many copyright violations do we have on this video? <laughs> and why was I looking at the things? Because the things told me more information about where the tapes came from. And I was trying to figure out what the experiment was all about. Well. The normal person wants to look at the people. But the thing is, we need to have people in this world that are interested in things. Or you're not going to have any iPods. You're not going to have any electricity. You're not going to have any computers. It's a lot of things. You're not going to have any music or any art. I mean, or all we would have is just the social yakety yaks. Because when you think about it, the really social people, they didn't make the first stone spear. People on the spectrum are more into details. Like you can see the big H and the little s's there. I'm faster at picking out the little letters than picking out the big letters. And so are most people with, with autism. We, I got social interaction through shared interests. We've got to get kids into school clubs like band, chess, robotics. These kids that are being tortured in high school, they need to be taking classes at the community college. I am very, very concerned about the lack of science teachers in the public school systems. Yeah, but you know where there's great science teachers? They're at your local community college. Because you have to have a degree in chemistry to teach at the local community college, but you only have to have a teaching certificate. And my great science teacher that really helped me, my mentor science teacher, he was a NASA space scientist. You know, mentors that can get a kid interested. Some of the most successful Asperger's in Silicon Valley, the parents apprenticed them into the field at age eight programming is introduced. And they just are pulled into that field. And they're in there with all the other people that think programming is really cool. <laughs> well, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. A lot of people wonder, well, what makes Google work? What makes Yahoo work? What is that? What's the size of seven Costco stores? And it's really, really cool. Well, search engines don't just come out of your computer. There's an electronic library. Hundreds and thousands of computer servers in there. It's like hundreds of thousands of PC guts in this building. And they're all wired together massively parallel. And I'm like, going, wow, you know, that is like super, super, super cool. There was an article that was in Fortune magazine. You know, there's all kinds of interesting things. And we need to be getting, you know, a lot of interesting things into the, into the school libraries, like science and nature. Science has a wonderful thing called NetWatch. And every week they review about three fantastic scientific web pages, you know, that are just on every kind of different subject. You know, if you don't expose kids to interesting things, then how? I'd rather I want them to get. A, I'd rather have them get obsessed with server farms than obsessed with video games. And I like video games. Uh, there's only one thing I like them to do with video games is learn how to program them. I'm not that interested in having them play them. I'm very interested in having them program. Now the problem is, I'm the kid who would be addicted to video games. And I don't have the math skills to program them. So we need to be limiting the video game playing to an hour a day. 
And we've got to start thinking when a kid's like 10 years old, especially these high-end, high-smart kids, what are they going to do when they grow up? And the thing is, you don't learn skills instantly. It took me three years to learn my cattle handling stuff. That doesn't happen just overnight. Well, to show you a little glimpse inside, boy, the thing is like really wild. Look at the electricity it takes to run it. Well, that's a lot of power boards there. I can run maybe uh, four mega meat plants off of, um, off of all the power boards. It takes one server farm. Somebody's got to figure out how to make this more energy efficient. The electronic library is a real energy pig. And somebody's going to have to figure out how to change that. That's going to be the Asperger mind that's going to do that. You know, but I looked at that and I go, oh man, that's heavy electricity. I mean, that's like way cool. You know, some of the best social life I ever had was working on construction. I loved sitting around the trailer and we just discussed building things. And I was a really good member of the little boys club and the things we get laughing really hard about, really, really inappropriate things that I'm not going to discuss here. <laughs> but all I can say is we laughed so hard the trailer almost fell over and it was really fun. <laughs> I'm very concerned today about all the bad behavior on TV. Sports people behaving badly, these mean, nasty shows. I hate that, hate, hate that Donald Trump show, you're fired thing. I hate Survivor. I mean, what happened to cooperation? and getting people to cooperate. Now, I like that show like, you know, Extreme House Makeover. That show I like because, you know, some low-income person or something's getting that. You know, but we need to be teaching values. You know, when I was a child, I didn't see grown-ups behaving badly on TV. I didn't see sports beh figures behaving really badly and getting away with it. Movies today don't have clear-cut values about right and wrong. When I grew up, there were very clear-cut values about good and bad with Superman and the Lone Ranger. Uh, good guys and bad guys. Now, all this may sound really corny, but these things made a really big impression upon me. And we need to teach positive religious values, let's say simple things, like you help the poor, you know, be a kind person. Uh, you know, you might try something like get a what would Jesus do keychain and let's think up good deeds that you can do. Concrete, positive things, let's avoid all the negativity. You do not want the Asperger mind going into that. Because the Asperger mind is a tendency to dwell on the negative. We've got to work on the positive, good things, concrete good things you can do, like you know, build houses for people, or you know, work in a food kitchen, things like that. I'm a big believer that OT and sensory integration is part of a good program. Do things like pressure, like swinging, like balancing activities, right while you're doing your ABA. And sometimes that helps the speech to come out. Especially the balancing and the swing and the pressure. You know, here's a, here's a uh, teacher uh, working with a kid and, and, and somehow these activities stabilize the brain. We don't really know how they work, but it does. It's just amazing. And here's my squeezing machine. When I got into puberty, I started having absolutely horrible, horrendous anxiety attacks. Terrible anxiety attacks. They worsened as I got older. And I noticed that when cattle let them squeeze you, they kind of relax. So I built this squeezing thing. Pressure is calming. The anxiety attacks were horrible. And eventually, in my early 30s, I got them under control of medication. I was one of the people that had to take medication. I just uh, wouldn't have functioned without it. There's other people that don't need the medication. It's very, very variable. I cannot emphasize that enough. There's the front view of the machine. I think it's very important to de touch desensitize little autistic kids. Because feeling that nice feeling of being held helps you to have positive, nice feelings. And when I was a little kid, I didn't like being held. But gradually, you can just work on desensitizing. Remember, firm pressure is calming, light tickle touch is alert. You don't want to use firm pressure. Now, this is a rule system I still live with today. I've taken all the world's rules, and I've made them into four categories. You've got really bad things. If you want to have a civilized society, you've got to control things like killing people, burning down buildings, wrecking stuff, and stealing. Then you have your courtesy rules. Those help people to get along. All societies have those, like manners and that kind of stuff. Then you have illegal but not bad. This is where you can break some rules. <laughs> Especially stupid bureaucratic school rules. <laughs> but then there's some other rules that are very, very specific to the society. I call them sins of the system. Well, you know, like drug offenses. Well, 
Some states, it's 10 years in the slammer for some drug offense, where you could go out and shoot somebody and you might be, have less years in the slammer. That doesn't make any sense. There are rules with draconian penalties, with no logic. Boy, you don't touch the sins of the system. It's just that simple. You're going to be in tons of trouble. And something that's a sin of the system here is nothing, maybe over in some other country. They're very, very society specific. You know, Einstein had many autistic traits. Einstein to be diagnosed autistic day. No language until age three. Well, what happened to Einstein today? This is a nice book. It's a Future Horizons book, Asperger's and Self Esteem. It's about famous scientists and musicians that probably had Asperger's. And it's available on Amazon.com. And I think it's a great book for teenagers that's being teased and tortured to see that, yep. Yeah, a lot of these other famous people. There's also a book called I Woes. It's about Steve Wozniak, the inventor of the um, Apple computer, the first personal computer. Let me tell you, he said his relationship with his dad was engineering, engineering, and more engineering. He really emphasizes the mentor teachers. This is not a social book. People that want to be social are going to hate this book. But if you want to understand at least the mindset of you know, my kind of you know, autistic Aspie kind of mind, um, I thought it was a lovely book, and I'd especially uh, recommend reading the first half. You know, the childhood years, lots of tricks, lots of pranks and things. It's a kid who would have gotten in tons of trouble today, uh, you know, if he hadn't been mentored. Now there's the NASA Satellite Assembly Building. I like to call it the world's biggest sheltered workshop that's socially challenged. How do we prepare people for employment? We've got to start teaching work skills early. I had jobs when I was early. I had a seamstress job when I was 13. Internships in college. I've seen people with, on the spectrum graduate from college and don't get jobs. We've got to start getting interns. You've got to start learning things like being on time, doing what the boss tells you to do, mentors. You've got to visit interesting workplaces. Bring all the trade magazines into the school library so kids can be exposed to interesting jobs, from dairy to computers to banking to baking, you know, whatever. Wall Street Journal has all kinds of good social stories on how to behave at work in it, because even the normal people need that now. They didn't used to need that. <laughs> the other thing that I had to do is I had to sell my work, not my personality. And I sold jobs by making portfolios of my work, pictures and drawings of jobs. And I have a book called Developing Towns and they, you know, on the whole job thing and you know, making a good portfolio. Because you've got to work on developing a skill that other people value and want. And one of the things you've got to do for being weird is you've got to get really good at that skill. <laughs> people respect talent. And talent attracts mentors. You know, I have a typical family history. Four generations of bankers on my father's side. My grandfather on the mother's side, MIT trained engineer. Simon Baron Cohen has found this two and a half times as many engineers. Family history of people with autism. Anxiety and depression, both sides of the family. Visual thinking skills on the mother's side. Food allergies on my dad's side. Uh, Asperger's traits on the father's side, and intellectual giftedness definitely on the mother's side of the family. Very, very typical family history. I was not a regressive type aut autistic. I was a type where there were some problems right from the start with sensitivity to touch, and my language came in gradually and slowly. Let's get kids interested in things like Lego Mindstorm clubs. You know, this is the kind of thing that teaches engineering and job-related, you know, mechanical and programming skills. I would rather say I'm obsessed with this than with video games, because it's a, it, it teaches definite things that are going to be useful at work. Let's take advantage of our educational resources, our community colleges. There's all kinds of wonderful courses in community colleges. I just talked to a parent in Colorado where her son is taking art classes at the local community college. She got him out of the high school. It's been the best thing that ever happened. Technical schools, you know, electricians and plumbers, we're, we have a shortage of them. That's a good jobs. You know, there's some visual thinkers that be really good at that. Online classes, university classes. Let's take advantage of these things. 
But the thing is, the kid's got to realize it's a grown-up privilege to take a, a grown-up course. He must not interrupt class. He must not send goofy emails to an online class. And one of the things I was able to do was rise to the occasion and act grown-up in working on, on something grown-up. There's the plant where I started my career. You know how I got in? I met the wife of their insurance agent. I'm not kidding. You never, never know who is going to open up the door. And she liked my hand-embroidered shirt. This is not it, because it's computer-embroidered. The thing is, I was wearing the portfolio, but I didn't realize it. It's just that simple. Hey, let's look at jobs for visual thinkers. Graphic arts and drafting, uh, hardware, setting up all the computer hardware, auto mechanic, fixing computers, handcrafts, photographer, animal trainer. These are all in the talents book. They're also on a website called autism.org. Autism.org. It's got these jobs on it. How about the music and math minds? Math teacher, scientist, chemist, statistician, physicist, engineer. These are the things that work, you know, the music and math minds can excel at. Now how about our verbal guys? Journalist, librarian, anything with record keeping, analyzing stocks and bonds, bookkeeping jobs, uh, special ed jobs. These are all things that they could be good at. Taking care of inventory. We've got to find things that are going to use their area of strength. Like there's a special kind of mathematical thing in banks called derivatives. I don't even know what they are, but there's, there's, there's some kind of financial thing, and they've got to do this fancy math for it. And there'd be some people that'd be just great sitting in the back room and over a computer doing derivatives. <laughs> or figuring out risk in insurance, actuaries. Figure out insurance risk. These are bad jobs, even for people like me. Multitasking, I have a terrible short-term memory. I cannot remember long verbal strings of information. I need directions in writing. Like when I had one of my first jobs milking cows, I was so thankful that the directions for cleaning the milking machines were written down and were on the wall. I would have been in a lot of trouble if the directions had not been on the wall. So I could always go back and refer to them. Cashier in a busy restaurant, that's not going to be the job for me. Big, big disaster. How about nonverbal people? Find something they can do. You know, shelving books, stocking shelves in stores, sorting jobs. You know, you got to figure out, you find something that they're good at doing. Okay, now there's a gorgeous picture that somebody on the spectrum made about moderate functioning. No computer tricks here. But this person's going to need an agent to sell their work. I've seen some successful things where. The person with autism was making artwork like this, and then the parents had set up a business, you know, selling the work. This is no computer tricks. This is just on a tripod, nice time lapse, just beautiful. Let's talk about some medication things. What I want to try to get you to do, and you've got good doctors here at the Mind Institute. One thing lucky you've got here is you've got fantastic doctors. But boy, I get out into the hinterlands, and oh, man. The pharmacology uh, disasters, you know, somebody's taking 10 different things. There was no thought put into anything. I can't emphasize enough, every case is different. I want to try to get you to think logically about what you do. You know, one really important thing is try one thing at a time. If you start a diet and ABA at the same time, you don't know what worked. You start a drug at the same time, you start a diet. You don't know what worked. Then there's a the big fight between conventional and alternative medicine. I'm sick of it. <laughs> you know, sometimes the most sensible thing to do is some sensible combining of the two. And I kind of, you know, obviously, a refereed scientific study is the best way to evaluate things. But with autism being so variable, you know, you might only have one in five where the diet works. So I have another criteria for evaluating something where I don't have nice scientific papers. You know, is I got to have three families where they've not communicated, that I can talk to, and they can convince me that the thing worked. And I question them in a lot of detail about other things that were started at the same time. I got that for diets. I got way, way more than free. I mean, I had a student that would have flunked out of school if she hadn't done wheat-free and uh, casein-free diet. 
and take out the soy and all the sugar, a bunch of the sugar out of it. There's some people where that really works. It's worth a try. You got a one in five chance that's going to be worth the hassle to do it. And it's not dangerous. You've got to look at risk versus benefit. You know, there's some stuff out there that people are doing that's kind of dangerous. You know, cost versus benefit. Oh, there's stuff out there that's just a rip off. It's just unbelievable. Evidence of effectiveness. We already talked about that. Scientific paper preferred, but there is such a thing as good anecdotal. You know, I just have, um, especially on, 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 on some of the diet stuff, I've got that. Okay, let's say you have a nonverbal and you've got some bad behavior, like they're biting themselves, they're having constant tantrums. The first thing you've got to do is rule out a hidden painful medical problem. That has to be ruled out. A toothache, an earache, acid reflux, constipation, you know, a root canal that's gone bad. You know, those things have to be ruled out. Then it may be sensory, or maybe a new cell phone got brought to the office, and that new cell phone hurts their ears. And all they got to do is see that phone and start screaming because you never know when it's going to go off. Well, then change the ringtone on. There's no excuse for having a phone that bothers them. Then it may be behavioral. And you've got to figure it out. Then you might want to do some sensory things. They may need some medication. But, you know, people get way too one-minded. Well, we just do ABA or we just do drugs. Well, that's just stupid. I take much more eclectic approach to things. You've got to figure out what works. Okay, here are some behavior causes of severe behavior problems. They're frustrated because they can't communicate. They want to get attention or they want to get out of doing something. And the behavior specialists are really good at keeping a diary to figure these things out. Okay, now I like to use a military analogy when we're going to talk about drugs. You know, you got different weapons here. And <laughs> SSRIs, they're your pistols and rifles. You know, they're the light weapons. Usually it's a good idea to start with the light weapons first because they've got less side effects. You know, these are the drugs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And I'm the kind of person where antidepressants saved me. In my early 30s, I went on a small dose of an old-fashioned drug, Norperman. Not your first choice now. It's got some cardiac hazards. Not your first choice. But the thing is, I've been on it forever, so I don't dare change it. Let's say you've got an older adult. They're maybe taking two things, a moderate dose, and they're lovely and stable. Don't mess with it. The old engineering thing, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. But one of the things where these drugs really work is for the anxiety, panic attacks and anxiety. Another thing that people need to do is plenty of exercise. I do 100 sit-ups every night. I hate every single one of them. <laughs> but I'm sleeping better than, I'm, than when I'm doing it. I want to tell you another little thing about drugs. Drug companies sell drugs that are on patent and make them lots of money. Now, they don't care about Prozac and Zoloft anymore because they're off patent. Uh, which one do you try? Uh, sometimes you want to try the cheapest one first. You try the one your HMO is on. Uh, don't try something that a blood relative had a very successful time with. Don't try something a blood relative hated. If I was just going to pick a drug off the shelf, probably wouldn't pick Paxil. It's got, uh, there's some bad scientific papers on Paxil. But if you're on it and it's working, you stay on it. Can't emphasize that. If if it, then it's right for you. But it's probably not the best first pick. Uh, I know a lot of people in the design industry that are on Prozac. I mean, you know, there's a lot of meat plants I've been designed on Prozac. <laughs> but these things, compared to some of the heavy artillery, have milder side effects. You don't get tardive dyskinesia. You don't gain like 100 pounds on this stuff. You know, a really bad side effects. So these are the light weapons. And these are heavy artillery, tanks, mortars, rocket launchers. And the thing is, these are on patent. So they're pushing them. And these drugs have much more serious side effects, like weight gain and tardive dyskinesia, the Parkinson's shakes. They just got Respiridol um, approved to five-year-olds. And I would like to um, about puked when I read the ad for this. You know, my, the, let's be sensible. The younger the kid, the more conservative you'd want to be about medication. But a really good principle is, is you just have a wow factor. Now, where Respiridol really works is some severe aggression problems but not for two-year-olds tantrums. For you know, older child or adult, a really good basic principle is you must have some wow factor. 
And you probably don't want to start out with heavy artillery first. But the problem is the heavy artillery is all patented. And our, my light weapons, they're all, um, they're all coming, well, some of them are still patented, but some of the oldies but goodies, they're off patent. So they're not interested in selling them. They sell the stuff that's on patent. It's that simple. Read the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal's got tons of, tells you all about drug companies. And, but it's not as simple as saying, well, drugs are evil and we only use the alternative methods. It's sometimes a little of each. Like Donna Williams, she used to be totally against medication. She gave a big talk seven or eight years ago down in Sydney, Australia. She was doing the Erlen lenses, she was doing a special diet. But she could not tolerate big convention center. And then she added a little teeny, teeny dose of respiral, a very teeny quarter of a milligram. Then she could do convention center. But she still had to do a special diet and her and lenses. But a teeny, teeny little dose, one fourth starter dose. You know, she didn't get fat off of that. You know, that was all right. You know, you better have some wow factor where you go, oh, wow, this stuff really works. And you don't let yourself get fat on it. And 100 pounds of weight gain, that's not acceptable. And the one that tends to be the worst on that side, Prexa. I have talked to parents where the kid was eating dry dog food on Zyprexa, obviously. You can't do, use that, but maybe another kid, it won't have that effect. Again, things are very variable. But if you're having a problem with the weight gain, you need to try something else. Sometimes you can switch to Geodon. And the, and the scientific articles are very clear on Respiridol on the anti-anger thing. But one of the ways that I dealt with anger, when I got kicked out of school for throwing a book at a girl and fighting, was I switched from anger to crying. See, I can't modulate emotion. So I just switched to crying. And then and sometimes I can get laughing. You know, I was always testing the limits, testing the limits. And I knew there was one house in the neighborhood where I could do, I could do really bad destructive stuff, like gluing a door shut with epoxy. <laughs> I wouldn't dare do that anywhere else. <laughs> now, this is an important principle. You know, with all the antidepressants and with the atypicals, oftentimes a little teeny dose. The big mistake I hear, and I've talked to probably a hundred parents on this, I'm so sick of this. We did really great on a little dose. And when we took a big dose, he couldn't sleep, and he got all agitated, and he went crazy. Well, there's differences now that drugs are metabolized, and some people on the spectrum need little tiny doses. Another principle is every time you have a meltdown or a problem, you don't get more stuff. This is where you get into a, a, a thinking that's totally illogical. And the kid's on eight different things and straddling in it. And they're just throwing stuff at it until they've like made a zombie out of them. That's just terrible. You get out in the hinterlands, it's disgusting. I mean, you're lucky to have the Mind Institute here, and you know, people aren't going to do awful things like that. But boy, I can tell you, I got out in the hinterlands. Ugh. And I did a talk one time with Margaret Bowman, and, and uh, I was telling her about the hinterlands. And she went out to the hinterlands, and she says, yeah, I see. I'm really shocked at some of the stuff that's going on. Here are some principles. Try one thing at a time. That applies to both alternative things and to medications. So you know what works. You know, a medication should have an obvious good effect. Like, wow, this really works. A teasy bit less hyper, that's not a good reason for taking a powerful drug. It better be like, wow, uh, the tantrums are now one a week instead of, you know, six a day. You know, that'd be an example of wow factor. Okay, let's say you got one of these kids at the walking pharmacy and you got rid of some of the junk. Take them off one at a time, very slowly. And be careful switching brands. I've found in my own case, I take two drugs now. I take Norperman, old fashioned, not your first choice probably now. And I take Diazad for my Meniere's disease. And I found that when I, on the generics on the Diazad, which is a diuretic, that's just a water pill, that the cheap junk my grocery store sold didn't work as well as the, as the generic I bought over at the specialty drug store. And when, I, and when I tried generic on Norperman, it didn't seem to work. Now, the thing is, you've got to figure out what dose on the, you know, stick with the white pill. If you got the white pill, stick with it. Because there's differences now they dissolve. You know, the generics are fine, but don't be switching. Find one thing and stay with it. And don't expect any drug to give you 100% control. It's not. It's not going to happen. Now, some people, especially some of the uh, nonverbals that are having these sort of little epileptic outbursts, sometimes some of these old things like Depakote can really work. And there's a lot of papers. I just recently updated the drug section in Thinking in Pictures. Um, this is an old cheap one, 
But if you do epilepsy drugs, you've got to have to do these awful blood tests. And you have to do it. It's have to. I know, um, I had an awful thing with one of my friends who was getting migraines, and they just gave her some free samples from one of the modern epilepsy drugs where you're not supposed, you don't need the blood test. Well, guess what? She almost croaked from liver damage uh, eight months later. <coughs> epilepsy drugs are good drugs, but boy, you better do your blood tests, or <laughs> you really better do them. <laughs> Here's one of the oldies but goodies, sometimes for anxiety, the beta blockers. They're using those now in PTSD. But you know what? They don't care about these drugs. These are old things, old, ancient, cheapo generics that go off patent. Who cares about selling these things? You know, I think the beta blockers for some of this anxiety, there needs to be a lot more research done again with the beta blockers. But nobody wants to fund research for ancient, old, unpatentable generics. You got to look up your interactions. And there's a good book called The Pill Book. Very good book. It's called The Pill Book. It really explains the interactions. You got to check interactions with non prescription stuff like cold pills, cold pills and sinus medication, mess up antidepressants, um, herbal supplements. Uh, you know, you got to check up all your interactions. Right? And some interactions are a nuisance, and some interactions are extremely dangerous. So you better be checking into it. You know, when I talk to someone about the special diets, you know, the omega threes are starting to get some good, uh, uh, good science behind them. There's some people that respond to some of the vitamin supplements. Vigorous exercise research is very clear. There was a paper just this year in the American Journal of Psychiatry on, vis on vigorous exercise and depression. Weighted blankets or vests are calming. You know, let's kind of you know use a variety of things, but let's be logical about it. So just some places where get some other information autism.org, and then of course got to show books there, and they still got a few left out there. And what I think we're going to do is I want to thank everybody for coming, and then we'll do some questions. A few people need to leave because the parking is probably a nightmare out there. Hello? Oh. Yeah. Um, I have a question about you talking about the drugs and interaction, and I wanted to know in the hinderland, as you said, a lot of people have been doing chelation. And what is your thought about chelation? Well, one of the problems on chelation is there's a lot of different stuff that people are doing called chelation ranging from stuff with IVs that can get pretty dangerous to innocuous stuff uh, with vitamins and, and some pretty innocuous supplements and then some medications that are sort of medium. Uh, that's one of the problems uh, on, the, on, the, on the more safe types of chelation, not the dangerous stuff with IVs. I got one family with a very medically involved kid with a lot of gastrointestinal problems where it may have had some mild benefit. I don't have the other two families. I don't, I'm not hearing the kind of reports on that that I'm hearing with something like diets. Almost every family I talk to, it's confounded by ABA and, and the diet, which are two things that I know often work. You know, that's, and it may be there's a narrow subgroup in there where it works, but the problem is you got like 10 different things are calling chelation too. You know, where at least something like the special casein and gluten-free diet, that's more uniform as to what that is. It's more uniform as to what ABA is. Hi, I have a question about the kids in a general ed setting who tend to pick up the academics and do pretty well, um, but the main problem is just the spacing out. You know, in the middle of instruction, they just kind of space out and you have to really try to gather them back in to get their attention. Well, some of the times they'll space out when they get sensory overload. Other times they space out and they just get bored. And one of the things on a lot of these problems with the sensory overload, these problems get worse when they get tired. So I'd recommend doing the really hard work first thing in the morning when the kid's fresh and do the more fun, easier things in the afternoon. But the things that require a lot of sustained attention, so you gotta remember these interconnecting circuits aren't as good, so it's harder for them to maintain attention. You know, and if you can do things, if the kid has visual processing problems and fluorescent lights are bugging him, 
you know, then get his desk over by the window or something, you know, to try to, you know, reduce some of the sensory distractions. Then sometimes spacing out is just simply not paying attention to. <coughs> Um, you said that you had problems with hair washing. How did you finally desensitize yourself? Well, I couldn't stand water in my eyes. And unfortunately, when I was a little kid, we were doing all the hair washing in the sink, which I hated. I found it was a lot easier doing it in the shower because I could put my head back and wash my hair without getting water in my eyes so much. And, but I still have a towel that I hang right on the door so that I can rub, do, dry my eyes several times uh, during the shower. And that, that helps me. And then the other thing is haircuts and the buzzer clipper thing. Um, well, one of the things, get a buzzer clipper and have it at home and get them used to it. You know, there's a lot of things you can kind of work on getting them used to it at home, have them hold it. And um, uh, get them used to the sound, the use of the feel of it. You know, and where it isn't just a big shock when you go into the, you know, the barber shop to get a haircut. When you talked about verbal people and how good careers for verbal people, were you meaning autistic people that are, tend to be more verbal? Because I thought. No, when I'm talking about verbal, I'm talking about verbal thinking, where, where they're not a visual thinker, they're not a music and math mind. But they are autistic. They're, yeah, they're autistic or they're, or they're Asperger. They're the ones that tend to, be, uh, tend to not have obvious speech delay. Um, but they're the, the, they're the kind of kid that loves history. They're not good at drawing, and they know all the facts and figures about their favorite movie star or a baseball player or weather reports or whatever the thing is that they're interested in. What percentage of autistic kids are with the verbal, like you're saying? Well, the ones that are, tend to be the verbal thinker tend to not be the ones that have, you know, that, that lack speech or have had delayed speech. Now, whether you're going to be a pattern thinker or a visual thinker, you got to look at if, if, the, if the guy's got visual processing problems, he isn't going to be a photorealistic visual thinker because he can't get the pictures onto the hard drive. You got to get pictures onto the hard drive to be a photorealistic uh, visual thinker. But there's a tendency sometimes for a person to be more auditory attuned or more visually attuned. And one thing that's going to affect that is how well their hearing's working or how well their vision is working. And the kids that do a lot of flicking like this, a lot of looking out the corner of their eye, uh, they hate fluorescent lights, they hate escalators. A lot of those kids oftentimes tend to be less of a visual thinker and they're more of an auditory learner. You know, it's going to vary a lot and you can sometimes get mixtures of these kinds. Yep. How did you invent the squeeze machine? Well, I invented the squeeze machine. I was having horrible nerve attacks when I, got, when I was 16 years old. And I noticed that when cattle went in the squeeze chute for their vaccinations, that sometimes they just kind of relaxed. So I, I built a, the squeezing machine modeled after the cattle squeeze chute because the pressure all over big parts of my body helped to calm me down. Scared to go into the squeeze machine? Well, I could control it. It's really important that the person using it controls it. Yeah? I'd like to ask a question about my four-year-old autistic son. Um, when you say that um, he that you didn't have verbal skills until you were three or four, that's right. What do you mean? By, my son can verbalize by echoing, and he is making more spontaneous um, words. But now, when he's echoing, are you getting nice, clear words out? Yes. That's be thankful. The kids that echo like that with the clear words are going to learn to speak. But the thing is, they got to learn that the words have meaning. Lots of times they think the tone of the voice is the words rather than the actual words. Just start teaching them lots of sight words, hundreds of flashcards. Well, he can read perfectly everything. Oh, well, good. And he writes, but well, he good. doesn't comprehend. Well, he start comprehend. teaching comprehension with very concrete questions. I mean, let's say you, um, uh, Jane went to the store and she bought, you know, bread and Campbell's soup and, you know, and uh, Jello then you might ask him to name uh, the things she bought at the store. You know, start out with very, very concrete questions. Don't ask a question like, well, why do you we need a winter coat or something? <laughs> well, you might need a winter coat because it's cold, but um, just start. 
You know, let's say he's reading a story about going to Antarctica. Don't ask why you need a winter coat. Ask questions like, well, how many dogs are on the dog team? You know, just very, very concrete questions. How old were you when you started to, when you can remember comprehending what you were saying? Well, I can remember, you know, four and five years old. And I also don't remember sequence. Like if I watch movies that have a real complicated, convoluted plot, I have a hard time following that. Thank you. Dr. Grandin, my 14-year-old uh, my son is um, very interested in, uh, in girls, and uh, he's an Asperger's kid. And I was just curious if you could give us some insight as to how you navigated the whole relational experience and um, work through that. I was one of the ones that just totally didn't do it. But I know that, I know that that is not what's going to work for a lot of people. And I would recommend finding a boyfriend or a girlfriend where you get shared interests. Like it'd be robotics, or it'd be computers, or it'd be science fiction, or it'd be, you know, showing dogs, you know, whatever the thing is that you like to do. So the, so the shared interest really starts the relationship. As a parent, um, I, I'm watching him be attracted to many neurotypical girls, and uh, there's a, quite a bit of rejection going on. Well, that's the problem. He needs to, he probably needs to, what's, his, what's he good at doing? What's he like to do? Well, then maybe he better go to the computer convention and look for a girlfriend there. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm being serious about that because that's where he's going to find a mate that's going to be a lot more appropriate and he's probably going to be a whole lot happier with. Hi. I was wondering um, what your thought is on stemming. On what? Stemming. Stimming? Yeah. Well, I was allowed to do a, a stimming for an hour after lunch. I was not allowed to do it at the table. You know, I do things like put my fork up in the air and sort of study it. That just wasn't allowed. Uh, I think a kid can have some downtime where he's allowed to do some stimming. But then there's where they're just rocking, they're flapping, you know, that sort of stuff. And <clears throat> the rest of the time, there's other times where they're not going to be allowed to do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Please join me in The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.